Welcome to ETF Market Insights, a weekly show focusing on the evolving world of ETF investing. Each Friday, a new panel of thought leaders aims to provide investment education and insights with the goal of helping you become an informed investor. Make sure to visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights to watch previous episodes. And remember to hit subscribe so you receive a notification when we post new content and when we go live each Friday. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started. Welcome back to ETF Market Insights. I'm your host, Aaron Allen with BMO ETFs. And today we're going to be going through the economic outlook with BMO BMO Capital Markets. Uh, So we'll be discussing some trends to watch as we continue to see no shortage of moving parts or or risk factors in today's environment. Um, We'll talk a bit about monetary policy, about currencies, the US credit rating downgrade, and of course, inflation as well. Um, A quick reminder that today we're not providing investment advice or recommendations. Today's show is all about providing education and information to the Canadian do-it-yourself investor. So today I'm welcoming back to the channel, Jennifer Lee, Managing Director and Senior Economist with BMO Capital Markets, uh, where she's been for two decades and is very well known for her easy to understand and call it like it is writing style. Um, If you haven't seen her research before, you can actually gain access to it um, on your own on capitalmarkets.bmo.com under uh, the research and strategy tab. There's a whole wealth of research, including Jennifer's that you can access there. But welcome back to the channel, Jennifer. It's great to have you. Thank you. Let's jump right into it uh, today as we've got half an hour and there's a lot to cover. Um, To get things started, I was hoping you could sort of provide us with a a breakdown of what you see as the key risks or things that you have your eye on in, in the economy today. Uh, well, again, thank you for having me on today. You know, there's, it's funny that you're asking me about risk because I'm a worrier by nature and uh, anyone who knows me personally knows that I'm always worrying and this seems to be like a, always like this long list of things to be concerned about. Um, these days, right now, just off the top of my head, you've got China, for example, uh, just all the signs, especially lately, of uh, slower growth after, you know, after the economic uh, reopening in Q1. We've already seen steady signs of consistently slower growth. And that's definitely one of the key risks out there for the global economy. Um, I'm always worried about central banks and worrying that policymakers are potentially going to do too much or too little, or maybe becoming a little bit too complacent about things. Now, I'm not seeing that too much yet, but I think everyone's sort of keeping their guard up. Um, and I'm also concerned about, you know, potentially, you know, there might be some political pressure, even though they shouldn't be because they're all independent, but there's possible uh, political pressure as well um, on the policymakers of what they should be doing. I worry about labor markets, uh, definitely labor markets. It's almost like this double-edged sword, right, where you have almost like too much of a good thing. And this is an issue of scarcity, by the way. You know, we have labor markets that are already very, very tight, jobless rates at or near, you know, uh, multi-decade lows. And yet we're already seeing um, things like retirements coming into play. There's something called peak 65, which is apparently taking place next year, where you're going to have like the most number of people all retiring at the same time for, or hitting that traditional retirement age. So you're going to see a lot of people falling out of the labor force because of that. And it's not as if like the well is being filled up any time quickly at, uh, at all either, because like birth rates and fertility rates are also quite low. Um, we already have shortages of certain professions. You've got doctors and nurses and teachers, accountants, you know, airline pilots, engineers, and technicians, still a lot of, oh, um, oh, construction workers, I should say, and truck drivers. That was a a thing before the pandemic. So a lot of shortages of certain sectors of of workers in certain sectors. And then you've got this thing, call it re-globalization, you know, where everybody were, you know, was basically caught um, 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 off guard when during the pandemic, they had a shortage of so many things like vaccines, for example. So now they are bringing a lot of the production back home in order to make sure that they have enough stuff within their own borders. So they're building lots of facilities to create uh, these these things, and yet they're still not finding enough people to do the job. So there's the labor shortage. Always, of course, politics and geopolitics, you know, the ongoing war uh, in in, in Ukraine, the geopolitics between China and the US, um, China and Europe, Europe and Russia, uh, China and Philippines most recently. So there's lots of that going on, and that is uh, very worrisome. And I think last, but certainly not least, not least on my list, climate change, 
whether, I mean, this has been a thing on everyone's radar, but maybe not top of mind, but now I think it's almost on everyone's uh, radar, especially these days when you hear about, you know, having July being like the record, the record, uh, July was like the record hottest month ever. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but you get the idea. Yeah. You know, you hear about um, droughts and, and record high heat waves in Southern Europe, flooding in like Slovenia and Norway and Sweden and Beijing. And of course, the tragedy that we saw in Maui play out recently. So of course, you've got the, 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 the personal toll, you know, the loss of life. You've also got the economic toll um, and what it could potentially do, all this, all this, um, these heat waves, what could it could do for prices? Like, you know, water levels are low again on the Rhine River. The Panama Canal, apparently there's like a traffic jam because water levels are down as well. So they're taking, they're making the the, the, the ships take their time passing through the canal. So that I think could potentially, if this is sustained, could see a upward pressure, I think, playing out on prices. So that's that's a long list. A long list. <laughs> Not not a very bright spot to start our discussion today, but valid to understand all of the uh, moving parts. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had the U.S. credit rating being downgraded. I uh, would love to get your thoughts in terms of what that means and, and whether that was a shock to you. Um, first of all, it was a shock because it happened after the U.S. came to an agreement on raising the, the debt limit, even for just a moment of time. Um, now, Fitch basically cited fiscal deterioration um, over the last few years, um, the growing debt, you know, that uh, that the U.S. Uh, has accumulated, which is almost true for every country out there. Um, of course, how they, their government debt levels have eroded compared to the other AAA rated countries as well. So they're saying that there is some discussion about the political climate as well. So that may have played a role. Um, but I will note that just recently there was, there was news that uh, the House, uh, the, the Senate Majority Leader Schumer met with House Speaker McCarthy a few weeks back, and apparently they agreed to do a resolution to fund the government, uh, uh, the government at least for a few more months. So that's a good thing. Now, can we really blame what Fitch did? Not 100%. You know, I mean, I can't. I admit, I sort of eye roll once I roll when I hear the words government shutdown playing out again, and uh, it's like again, we're having hearing this again. But that's just a fact of life, you know. Um, and the fact that they have been spending so much, you know, it, this this is not sustainable. So just last week, I think we got the July Treasury budget deficit numbers, and it came in at 221 billion for that month alone, and over 2.2 trillion for the 12 months leading up to July. Compare that to a year ago, it was just over a, a one trillion. So it's basically more than double from 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 a year ago. Again, this is not sustainable. They cannot keep doing this. So at some point when this fiscal support is removed, this is going to be one less leg of support, I guess, for the U.S. economy to, to lean on. Now, in terms of what this means, you know, not much right now. The U.S., despite this downgrade, the U.S. still has like an enormous amount of trust around the world that they will, that they are credit worthy, that they will pay their debts. Uh, they will pay the, all, you know, all their interest. There's very little risk of default. But if anything, you know, they can't boast, you know, that we're AAA because they're not, you know, they're not AAA rated by all three, only by one. Moody still has them as AAA. Fitch obviously downgraded them. S&P did it back uh, a number of years ago. And I think it's just, I guess, a little embarrassing. You know, the White House wasn't really thrilled when they heard it. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen called it outdated and based on um, based on old facts. And she talked about how the economy was resilient and they did manage to lift the debt limit. So. Again, we do we shouldn't worry too much because there is still plenty of demand for U.S. Treasuries. Just recently, there's a huge uh, quarterly refunding, uh, big demand for three years and ten years, thirties, a little bit weaker, but still plenty of demand out there. So not a huge impact as of yet. But definitely embarrassing. All right, um, talk to us a bit about monetary policy, what the central banks are up to, you know, domestically, U.S. and globally and what you expect as we round out the rest of this year. So I'm going to quote a certain hip hop artist when he says, you know, we started at the bottom and now we're here. Uh, so everyone had cut rates, obviously, to record lows during the pandemic, and then they started ratcheting them back up um, afterwards. So now we're kind of putting them into like four buckets in a way. You know, we've got the, I used to say ultra doves, but I can't, or ultra hawks, but I can't say that anymore, but that's where you can find like the ECB and the Bank of England. You've got the ones who are super dovish. You can find that's the, the 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 People's Bank of China, the ones that were super dovish, but a little bit less so now, and that's the Bank of Japan. And then those that are like sort of in between, and that's where all the other major ones are, like the Fed, like the Bank of Canada, like the RBA or the or the Reserve Bank of uh, New Zealand. 
So I think what is happening is that everyone is sort of being data dependent. Everyone is watching all the data to make sure that you know things are not going the wrong way. And this is where I was talking about complacency and being wor you know, worried that they're going to be acting too aggressively or not acting enough. So the ECB is still very worried about inflation. They've got a lot of hawks on the committee, but they're also kind of concerned about what's happening with China. So that could be a little bit more of a detriment to them. So at the last meeting, President Lagarde said that, you know, that she was really playing it all out. She was like, we could raise rates or we could, or we could skip. And then we could, and then we could raise rates afterwards. So she was like all over the place, but basically being non-committal, which they should be, right? Everything should be non-committal. Everything should be dependent on the data. So we think that they're basically going to be finished as of now. I think July was probably their last rate hike, even though they're still standing a little bit on the hawkish side. Bank of England has still a lot of issues. They still have high inflation, even though it's come down uh, considerably, but you know they've got still double digit inflation in terms of food. Core inflation is still basically near record highs. Um, but they're still up against a lot of other problems right now. So we still think that there's at least one more rate hike up its sleeve, probably another 25 basis points. Plus wages are running at their uh, fastest pace on record, over about 7.8% year over year in the three months to June. So they have their issues there. So they're trying to keep inflation expectations down. Um, the Bank of Japan used to be the Uber Dove, and then recently they sort of tweaked their policy they basically target their 10-year um, JGB yield to be around 0%, zero, zero percent, and then they widen it to uh, 50 basis points, and then they widen it again to one, uh, one percentage point or one base or one percent. So they're basically allowing the yield to float around one percent. So that is a way becoming less, less um, easy, I guess, or, or a little bit, um, maybe not tight, obviously, but a little bit less loose. Um, it's going to take a little while before I think they start raising rates. But so I think, you know, um, they might actually ha happen to do it this year, but maybe not over the next couple of months. It's going to take a lot to think to push them off the sidelines, but they're becoming less easy, I guess. Um, and of course, the, Bank of, the People's Bank of China has been cutting rates because their economy is um, struggling to say, you know, to, to put it uh, mildly. And then, of course, you've got um, the Fed, Bank of Canada. For now, we think that they are done. Um, they have probably have their last rate hike. They're still probably speak a little bit more hawkishly, but they're definitely keeping an eye on the data. Some of the numbers that we saw recently for inflation for Canada, some retail sales numbers for the US still coming, going on strong. So that sort of, I think, quiets any discussion of any rate cuts, which we didn't think was even gonna happen this year. That's probably not, um, that's probably going to be like a 2024 story at, at, at the earliest. But if anything, they're going to keep rates at these levels, these restricted levels, for probably the rest of the year. Higher for longer. All right, here we go. Um, and then what's the outlook on the, the currency side of things and with the loonie? Do you expect it to strengthen or what's your outlook there? I'm going to lean on the or. <laughs> so the currency market has been super, super tough to, to forecast. I'm constantly talking to BMO's um, global currency strategist, Stephen Gallo. We're always you know, throwing ideas back and forth to each other. Um, overall, you know, we still expect the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar has probably peaked, but it's not coming down as quickly as we had thought that it would be. Um, just it, it could be for it was a bunch of different factors. You know, um, the Canadian dollar has been stronger since the start of the year, just mildly. The euro has been um, stronger as well since uh, since December. The pound has been picking up, and that could also be because of interest rate differentials. Um, weaker currencies so far this year, definitely the yen. Definitely, and that's because of the Bank of Japan. Um, not because it's becoming less loose, but because I think there is also fear about what it would do to the economy if they started, or when they started raising rates or started to starting to tighten. So there's a lot of concerns about Japan. So that's causing the yen to weaken it. It's becoming less of a safe haven currency what it normally would have been. Uh, the yuan has its own issues as well, given what's happening in China. So it's been right, uh, last check, it was almost at 7.30 versus the U.S. dollar, which is level that we haven't seen since October of last year, which is when those lockdowns kicked back in again. So now in terms of the Canadian dollar, we are expecting, we haven't changed our view too much. We're still looking for it to strengthen to about 130-ish by the end of this year. Just, you know, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to be correct on this whole soft landing story. If that's the case, then we'll see a risk on, which means the U.S. dollar will be weaker. Um, stronger oil prices are also helping as well as well as the overall, broadly speaking, the steady moderation in Canadian inflation. So all of that should be, in theory, supportive for the Canadian dollar. All right, very good. And then what's the latest on uh, employment? You mentioned labor markets as one of your key risks, but how's, how's that looking and how's it going to impact the economy? 
Well, the labor market is still strong. The end. Next question, please. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Um, it's still very strong, and I'm telling you this much. This has had been the the most defining factor out of this entire episode, if you will. You know that the fact that we have still strong employment demand, labor shortages, which is good and bad, depending on what you know what side of the the, the room you're, you're you're standing in. And this goes back to pre-pandemic times when, um, or to pandemic times when everybody had to lay you know thousands of people off, and then you couldn't get everybody back. So employers were basically remembering this nightmare of having uh, you know, not enough people working and they just do not want to be back in that vulnerable position anymore ever again. So instead of, even if, uh, if orders slow, for example, you know, I think they're more reluctant these days to let go of people. They'd rather just keep them on. Um, you know, call it, you know, if this is like a, a short downturn or whatever, they'd rather have everyone still on staff rather than going through the pain an aggravation of finding someone you know who is qualified and who is willing to show up for the for the job to come back onto the payroll. And besides, you know, you still have a lot of vacancies out there, especially in the US. You know, vacancies have been coming down overall, but there are still at last check like 1.6 job openings per unemployed American. So basically, you know, assuming everyone's qualified, which obviously this is a big assumption, but there's basically a job available for anyone who is unemployed. And that is, you know, that's Again, the vacancies are coming down, and that's what's going to happen when the Fed's tightening, when the economy is slowing, and you know it's just like a natural thing, a progression to, 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 to occur. But overall, I think this is still a positive thing. You know, it shows that wage growth is still strong, and that's great news for consumers. Now, the problem is, is that if consumers continue to take this money and continue to spend at a very fast rate, and that could be inflationary. That could fire up inflation again and the fed will be forced to step in and cool things down with higher rates and that would mean tighter monetary policy and that would mean a slower economy so yes there is such a thing as having too much of a good thing so ideally you know in the in the perfect world consumers are are having or have a job they're making a steady wage they're spending it they're also putting a, um, some aside for a rainy day um, so they're spending, but not too quickly. And this will help the economy sort of guide mm -hmm. along and maybe have that sort of Goldilocks ending that, you know, that would be ideal in the, in the, in the perfect world. Whether or not it exists is a different story. In a perfect world, yes. Now, real estate is definitely on the minds of many investors and myself included, but a bit of a loaded topic. How is the real estate market from, from your eyes in Canada looking these days? Well, you know, it's, I love when people ask real estate because I always think, how do, how, do, how do we even start with this, you know? There's no easy answer to this huge problem that we have. There's an affordability issue where it's tough to even buy a home these days because prices have skyrocketed so much. It's hard to maintain the, the home because mortgage payments have also risen as the Bank of Canada has been raising rates. You know, you've got a lack of listing. You have a lot of lack of options out there, um, which is keeping prices high. It's the classic supply and demand story. And you still have a very strong demand, um, broadly speaking. And this is from all angles. So the market still, in general, is still you know very tight. Listings are still low because nobody has to sell, which by the way, I don't think is a bad thing. Nobody has to sell, nobody is forced to sell, which I think is not, again, not a bad thing. Um, no one wants to sell, particularly, particularly into a down market. And nobody wants to sell because they might be locked in into a pretty decent mortgage. Um, plus the way the Canadian mortgage market is structured, you know, just as, even as rates are rising for those variable rate holders, they're seeing their amortizations stretched out. So they're still seeing their monthly payments still stay relatively the same, but they're just putting more toward the interest as opposed to paying down the principal. Now, there is some good news here, is that we just got the latest um, existing home sales numbers, um, courtesy of the Canadian Real Estate Association for the month of July. And it's showing that basically things are starting to balance out. We had home sales drop 0.7% uh, month to month, Still up 8.7% year over year, but that's because of a, of a weak year ago level. But new listings are starting to rise again. They've been up for four months in a row, and that has helped the um, 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 the market, I guess, balance a little bit because you've got ebbing sales, you've got more real resale supply, and that means a sort of a looser market out there. So it's almost like imbalance in what it has averaged over the last 10 years. So that is a good thing. But there's still obviously a lot of you know problems to work out. Now, a lot of pundits keep talking about more supply, more supply, but, you know, frankly, you just can't rely on supply alone. There's only so much you can do in, on that front because you can't, you can't create it very quickly. You can, it only responds very gradually, whereas demand can, can change very, very quickly. 
we have our limits in terms of supply. You know, there's not, this is like going back to the labor shortage, not enough workers, not enough contractors. Um, you know, personally, I just did a little bit of a reno and there is like shortages of cabinet makers, for example, in the kitchen, you know, um, uh, shortages of electricians, plumbing, a lot of shortages and anything that's real estate related. You know, there's a shortage of land, you know, think of all the green space that we're supposed to be keeping. This is back to the environment too. And of course we had all those supply constraints. So there's a shortage of materials. So there's only so much we can do, I think on the, on the supply front. Um, and then there are other issues to think about that's things that the Bank of Canada can't deal with, you know, like investors, for example, playing a key role in demand, boosting demand and keeping prices elevated for homes. So this is, definitely a problem. You had about a quarter of all dwellings apparently in 2020 were all uh, were owned by investors, like 25%, which is a very yeah. high number. Most of them were condos, you know, um, which is not a surprise, but 15% of single family homes were investor owned. So that sort of makes the affordability issue a little worse. Then of course, you've got what everyone's talking about these days is population flows, all the immigration that's coming in, um, record numbers of, uh, of immigrants, and they have to live somewhere. And it's interesting because our population basically grew 2.7% um, um, last year, which was the fastest since the 70s, um, which is almost uh, nearly 1 million people that were basically added to our population. And most of it was international immigration. Um, and half of that was for non-permanent residents, which is kind of an interesting thing. And on top of that, you've got this millennial cohort, these people that are like in the mid thirties or so that are basically expanding their families, moving out into the burbs. And they also want, homes as well. So you've got a lot of demand. So there's tons of man. We can't supply it as quickly as we can or we are able to. And that is causing this big affordability problem. But again, things are getting a little bit better. Bank of Canada keeping rates at restrictive levels and that's slowing demand, slowing sales, and it's also forcing some listings as well. So that's helping the market balance out a little bit. I guess it's better to see it slowly balancing it rather than a quick uh, correction yes. or something. Yes. <laughs> Um, what are your thoughts on inflation? I saw the U.S. reported this week, but do you think we're out of the woods yet? So I'm encouraged, I think, by what we've been seeing, that we're finally seeing, you know, um, inflation turn the corner. It was just last year, uh, last like August or September, that inflation hit its, its multi-decade highs in both Canada and the U.S. So we're finally seeing things coming down. So we're going in the right direction. Um, and at this point, you've got, for the U.S., we had three months in a row of better than expected inflation, which is good. The headline picked up a little bit. It was at a 27 month low in June of 3%, picked up a little bit to 3.2%, which isn't that bad. And core inflation, by the way, has slowed almost, almost every single month since it peaked last year. So that again is a step in the right direction. Now there are all these other components that the Fed is looking at these days. It used to be headline and ex food and energy, but now they're breaking it down between goods and services, and then within services, there's that thing called Supercore. So goods inflation has been coming down, is actually negative now from year ago levels for I think two months in a row now. And that's to be ex expected because demand for goods has ebbed quite a bit. Um, supply of goods has basically been coming back on stream because you've got China reopening, uh, so you don't have those, those issues anymore. So that is a good thing. Services inflation has been coming down as well, but it's still fairly elevated. And this is because demand for services is still very, very high. So people are still going out and having dinner. People are still traveling, especially in the summer now. So there's still a lot of demand for services. But bottom line, we are seeing lots of improvement on the, on the US front, um, but it hasn't completely packed up and gone away. We also got these producer prices, PPI, which is sort of a precursor to, the, to what we could see on the consumer price front. The latest report there were, was a little bit stronger than expected, a little bit hotter than expected. That shows that you know we haven't probably seen. Um, it's not only going to be it's going to be ups and downs, I think, for, for the, on the inflation front, and that's going to keep the Fed, I think, on edge, keeping a watchful eye to make sure that they don't need to step in again, and making sure that everything's going in the right direction. Now in Canada, I remember in the June CPI it hit 2.8%, um, and there was much joy in Whoville, you know, when we saw. Uh, inflation dipped below 3%, there's a lot of woohooing, or maybe that was just me, I can't remember, but it was a good report. And then we got the July figures, you know, we were expecting, we had expected a, an uptick, but it was a little bit hotter than expected, um, which is a little bit disconcerting, I think, especially for the for the Bank of Canada. A lot of it was due to shelter costs, 
um, also for food, higher food prices, airfares, travel services, um, and, and gas prices. And by the way, we could probably see more pressure from on the gas front because August so far has seen a big increase in gasoline. So at least, so that wasn't great news on the headline front, front and what was supporting the headline, but at least we got some better news on core readings. Um, the Bank of Canada likes to look at something called trim and, and median, and those numbers, those measures basically either came down a little bit or they're unchanged. So that is a good thing, but it's still very, very sticky. The Bank of Canada also mentioned that they look at the three month trend for those particular core components, and they said that it's been stuck in this three and a half to four percent range um, since September. And sure enough, for July, the average for those for those measures were right on three and a half percent again. So it shows again the stickiness of it all. And sure, it was easy, and I say easy, and I'm using my air quotes, coming down for those record high or those multi-decade highs from last year. And now it's like the hard part, getting from you know from roughly three and a half percent back down to that two percent target. So this is where it's going to be a challenge. So overall, encouraging off the highs, but I think the last you know stretch is going to be the hardest. And by the way, I should also mention like the weather component, like how that is going to impact again crop prices and food prices. So we could see some upward pressure there, which I think I mentioned earlier. So again, the Fed and the Bank of Canada and all the central banks have to keep a watchful eye on this. All right, great. And then to to wrap it all up with a bow, let's talk about probabilities of a recession. You mentioned you're in soft landing camp, um, but for our viewers, let's get rid of the capital market speak. And can you? explain what a soft landing is and why that is your outlook? I used to say, you know, are we in for a soft landing, a hard landing, or any landing? And a lot of people are always asking, what the heck is a soft landing or or any <laughs> landing? But it's almost like you're gliding in, right? But basically, a soft landing, which is which is the camp that we have been in for quite some time, showing a slowing in, in economic growth, you know, as the Fed, as the Bank of Canada tightens, but we're not, and we're seeing inflation come down gradually as well, but we're not seeing a big increase in unemployment. So that is what we call a soft landing. And this is all playing out so far. You know, we're seeing the R word and it's not recession, but it's resilience. And that's starting, uh, that's definitely making the rounds, especially over the last month or so. So we're, again, we're not calling for strong growth. You know, we're not like, you know, obviously not by any measure. In fact, we're actually looking for growth to probably contract in the first quarter of next year. But so far, the economy, both of them have not exactly slammed on the brakes, which is a good thing. So the US, it's all mixed, obviously, with every data point. Every month is, you know, it, it could changes, it, it goes up and down in every month. But broadly speaking, we haven't seen a broad deterioration or deceleration in economic growth. And yet inflation is still slowing down. So that increases the odds of a soft landing. You've got a bunch of things that the US economy is leaning on. Still, we're always talking about personal savings, and that's still a buffer, a strong buffer, even though they've run, the consumers have run down their savings, um, um, you know, uh, a considerable amount, but they still have a savings, a nest egg there. And as, and as long as the labor market remains strong, they continue to make a steady income, at least we can keep replenishing that supply of savings. And that's a good thing, for sure. There's a lot of catch up spending. Um, people used to call it revenge travel, but, you know, a lot of people still love to travel, and they're still doing a lot of that. Um, I believe our Brian Belsky, I heard the other day, talking about revenge eating, you know? So there's still a lot of dining out as well, going out for dinner or going out for lunch or going out for a drink. So there's still a lot of that discretionary spending going on. At the same time, we're also still seeing pent up demand for things like, especially on the auto front, uh, where they're waiting for their cars that have been backed up for so long because of all these supply shortages. So there's still a lot of spending on that front, but that is helping support this whole um, the U.S. economy as a whole and to help support this whole resilience theme. In the longer term, you've got a lot of spending from the government, which is, again, not, not the greatest thing, but, you know, we've got the Inflation Reduction Act. We've got the CHIPS Act, which longer term, you know, you're spending money to help um, build up the infrastructure of the U.S., to build facilities, to increase production of certain things that we may maybe not have been, never produced before here, like, like EVs, for example, and batteries, microchips. So all that is going to help support the economy, support business investment and support ongoing labor demand, even though there are there is a shortage on that front. Now, it's not a slam dunk, obviously, because there's still other issues that are playing out, like there's going to be student loan payments that are going to be um, resumed, resuming starting in, in October, for example. At some point, government spending is going to be cut back. And like I said, that's one less thing that they're going to be able to lean on. You know, But again, so we're looking for growth to slow, but not contract sharply. So again, we're not looking for an official 
recession by by that by whatever definition you want to use but we're still looking for overall growth but probably a contraction in at least one quarter now here in Canada it's a little bit more dicey things a little bit more choppy activity is definitely softening there's no question we're seeing some pretty soft June numbers so far and and for early July as well we've also been dealing with labors uh, labor strikes um, all the wildfires all across the country it seems so a lot of ups and downs and we're also looking for softer activity because the housing market which we're more dependent on has also been softening just because of these Bank of Canada rate hikes which is you know um, as to be expected um, employment has also started to soften as well um, so that's you know that's one of the reasons why you know we're covering a number of the reasons why the can the Canadian economy is probably lagging a little bit plus or lagging the US plus we're a little bit more sensitive to rate hikes because of the housing impact on, on our economy um, and then on, on the flip side you've got the US which are more willing to spend um, our consumers because of the housing market are a little bit less willing to spend on that front and gov Canada's government is not spending as much as the US so we don't have as much fiscal support which is good and bad I guess in many ways so overall still looking for that soft landing you know um, not looking for a hard landing um, but of course things can change and depending on what other black swans come out of the woodwork but so far you know we're looking for we're, we're seeing steady growth and that's definitely a good thing for the economy all right thank you so much jennifer i know that was a big ask to ask you to pile all that into a half an hour but you did a great job i do appreciate you sharing all your insights with us thanks um and that caps off another great week of market insights so i hope you'll join me again soon jennifer next week on etf market insights i'll be joined by mark merricks from nasdaq who's going to walk us through the nasdaq 100 index and specifically the latest uh special rebalance that took place at the end of last month, month, which was really an effort to reduce the concentration risk in that index, in that sort of magnificent seven, as it's being called, the Apple and Microsoft and Amazons of the world. Um, so more to come on that and how it'll impact your investments. So I hope you'll join us then. Bye for now. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. To stream any previous episode of ETF Market Insights series, please visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe and sign up for alerts so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at etfmarketinsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.